Isn't it so amazing that our Savior is alive, that our Savior has conquered death and rose in victory? I'm going to invite our choir to come up now. We just sang our full Easter cantata last week. It was such a blessing. If you missed it, you can view it online. We're going to sing a couple songs here. And the whole premise of this musical is the hope of the cross. Now, if you've heard me talk about this before, you would have heard me say that it's amazing that the cross, an instrument of death and destruction to anybody in the first century AD, would have been, quite frankly, bewildered that we would have symbols of a cross, of a Roman crucifixion instrument. But our God, the God of redemption and the God of all power, redeemed that instrument of death and destruction to an instrument of hope, to an instrument that reminds us of what Jesus Christ did, that he came, bore our sins, and rose from the dead so that we may have everlasting life with him. So we're gonna sing these two songs now, and I pray that they are an encouragement to you. Same power that rolls the stone. 
pray with me over our offering. Holy God, you deserve all our praise, all the glory. You provide everything we need, and you sent your son, Jesus Christ, to the cross to pay the price that we needed to pay. But through your grace and mercy, our Lord Jesus Christ did that. Heavenly Father, take this offering, multiply it for the spreading of the gospel, so the message of our Lord Jesus Christ and the redemptive grace that he provides, not only in this community, but our state and around the world, because the enemy is afoot, and we need to be about our Father's blessing business. Bless the givers, Heavenly Father, and bless this offering in your holy name. Amen. It was God's desire, his will, for heaven not to be without us. He wants us to repent and to trust in him. As it says in 2 Peter 3, 9, the Lord is not slow about his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. This doesn't mean that God needed us by any means. He wanted us. He loved us so much, not because we had anything to offer, but because he is love. He sent his one and only son, Jesus Christ, to save us. It is in his name, the name of Jesus, that we are saved.
Father, we thank you for sending your one and only Son, Jesus Christ, the name above all names, that beautiful, wonderful, and powerful name, Jesus Christ, the Savior of the world, your one and only Son, sent into this world as a lowly baby to grow up, to ultimately give his life on the cross to pay the price that we couldn't pay, the propitiation for our sin, to satisfy that wrath that was owed against sin. Jesus paid it all, and we owe him for everything we have. So we thank you. We thank you, Jesus. You are good, you are holy, you are magnificent, and the name above all aim, names. It is in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and the Holy Spirit that we pray. Amen. Church, amen. Please have a seat. It is time for our children's message. Come on up here, kids. I got a special sermon just for you guys today. If you're visiting with us and you brought your children, they're welcome to come on up here and sit with me for a couple minutes. Don't bump your heads on the tables. Those usually aren't here. Wonderful. All right, I think we have everyone up here who's coming. What do you all think is the most valuable part of your body? What do you all think? The thing that, like, you need the most to stay alive. Sophie. Okay, Sophie says heart. What do you think? Brain. Okay. Heart. Heart. Heart and lungs. Heart and lungs. Heart. A bunch of hearts over here. Heart. Love. Love. Okay, thank you. That's an important part of life. That's true. All right, last one. What? Brain. Brain? That's right. Okay, two more. Okay, thank you very much. You guys, you guys, you know that we need all those things to stay alive. But what happens if your heart stops? You die, right? Unless you have one of these things. Have you guys ever seen one of these before? Hopefully you never need one. This is a, called a defibrillator. A defibrillator. If your heart stops, they open this thing up, and they put this thing, they connect this thing to your body, and most of the time, it'll start your heart back up. Isn't that crazy? Your heart could stop, and then they put this thing on your body, and then it'll start your heart back up. Now, if you were to have your heart stop, and then Mr. Tommy or Mr. Steve or, or Miss Arden were to bring this over to you and put it on you and shock you and start your heart back up again, after that, do you think you'd live forever? No, eventually what would happen? Eventually, one day, your heart's going to stop again, and this thing ain't going to start it. You know what? I know somebody who can make you live forever. Did you know that? His name's Jesus. You know, when Jesus died on the cross and rose again on the third day, God gave him a glorified body. And Jesus walked around on this earth for 40 days after that, and then he just went up to be with God in heaven. You know that Jesus, when he rose from the dead, from that point on, will live forever. You know what? One day Jesus is going to give us, all believers, glorified bodies, and we're going to live with him forever in a perfect body 
that never hurts, you never get tired, you never have any pain. Isn't that going to be awesome? So this thing can make us come back to life for a little while, but Jesus alone can give us everlasting life, all right? So the word of the day today is life. So you can go back to your seats and count how many times I say the word life and let me know on your way out, all right? Thanks for coming up here, guys. I've got two things to say about that defibrillator. Number one, if you couldn't get excited about the Lord Jesus after that music this morning, you probably need one of those put on your chest to make sure that you're still alive. And number two, if you weren't here this morning, you missed an amazing breakfast. And if you had too much bacon, come up and see me afterward, and we'll make sure that we get that heart going again in case you have a heart attack from all the bacon that you ate at our breakfast this morning. Well, we are here today to celebrate the resurrection. You know, this morning we did our sunrise service, and many of you were there. And the beautiful thing about the sunrise service that we do on Easter Sunday is we gather in the dark, and, and it's real quiet. And then, and then as the sun gets ready to come up, creation starts to get a little noisier, right? The birds start chirping. The chickens start crowing. The mopeds start going by. And we were out there, and you see the morning sort of break, and all these beautiful colors start to, to pop up in the sky, and it reminds me of the world that God made. And God made this world, and God made everything in it. God designed us to have a relationship with him. God loves us. God designed us to, to walk with him. God designed us to live with joy. God designed us to know him. God designed us actually to live forever in the Garden of Eden with him. The problem with us is that just like Adam and Eve, we, we all choose to go our own way. We, we don't want to live in accordance with God's purpose, with God's design for us, right? We think we know how to do it better ourselves, amen? If you don't think that's true, ask someone that loves you and knows you really well, and they'll give you the truth. And the Bible calls that sin. Anytime we deviate from God's purpose and plan for our life, it's sin. We miss the mark. Now, the consequence of that, which we observe all around us every single day, is brokenness. Would you agree that the world is broken? Things aren't the way they're supposed to be. Even though we grew up, even though we were born into this brokenness, even though we live in this brokenness, we know that things just aren't right. The problem with this brokenness is we can't fix it. We do our very best. Humanity has tried for thousands of years to fix the brokenness and we just can't seem to get it right because at the core of the problem is us now God saw us in the midst of that struggle in the midst of our brokenness and out of his great love sent his one and only son Jesus God became man and dwelt among us Jesus lived that perfect life he, he always fulfilled God's purpose in every single moment of his life. He always told the truth. He never sinned. He, he never lied. He never had a hurtful word for someone else. He always obeyed his parents. He always did what was right. And so, through his life, Jesus perfectly fulfilled God's law. Now, God had a plan and a purpose for Jesus. Jesus' is calling, the reason he was sent for, for God, from God, was to seek and save that which was lost, to rescue you and me. And so after Jesus lived that perfect life, 33 years, he carried a cross up on the hill of Calvary. And he allowed his enemies to condemn him for crimes he never committed. He allowed himself to be nailed to the cross and upon that cross, Jesus received upon himself God's wrath for the sins of the world, for you and me. For everything that we deserve, for all the things that we have done wrong, Jesus received our penalty. He died on that cross and his blood poured out as a covering or an atonement for our sin. After he died, some faithful followers of him buried him in the ground. 
And on the third day, he rose again. As that song said, death could not hold him. The grave could not keep him. Because Jesus conquered death and conquered the enemy Satan and sin. And now through him and his resurrection, we have the opportunity to receive from Jesus everlasting life. Why is the resurrection necessary? That's the question today. Most Easter Sundays, we rightfully celebrate the resurrection. We go through the resurrection stories in the Gospels, and we celebrate that Jesus was once dead, and then he came alive. We celebrate that, and that's good. And we're celebrating that this Easter. This morning, on this Easter Sunday, I want to give you three reasons why the resurrection is everything. What exactly did Jesus accomplish when he rose from the dead? That's what I'm going to talk about this morning. The first thing he accomplished is he secured our regeneration. Jesus made it possible for us to be born again. During Jesus' life, sort of toward the, the middle endish of his ministry, before he died on the cross, under the cover of darkness, a Pharisee named Nicodemus came to visit Jesus because he was afraid to visit him during the daytime. And Nicodemus believed in Jesus but was trying to sort out who he was and what he came to do. And Jesus looked at Nicodemus sort of in, in this awkward break in their conversation. And he just looks at Nicodemus and he says, you need to be born again to receive eternal life. And if you read that in John chapter 3, Nicodemus sort of stops and he says, how, how is that even possible? How can someone be born again? How, how is it possible for someone to be born and then to go back into their mother's womb and then be born a second time? And then Jesus continues to teach Nicodemus what he means. Not a call from God, a requirement for God to be physically born again, but a calling from God toward a spiritual rebirth. To be born again means to receive a new spiritual life from God. And the effect of being born again is that you are now righteous before God. He sees you. But within you, he sees the righteousness of Christ. The old you with all of your mistakes is gone. And a new you is placed there by God's Spirit. I made a lot of mistakes. Anybody in there make any mistakes? We make a lot of mistakes, don't we? You might have made a lot of mistakes today. You might be saying, how is that possible? I will never be righteous before God. It's impossible. And you know what? You are 100% right. It is impossible. You can't do it. It reminds me, yesterday we were getting ready for the sunrise service outside, and we had these uh, torches, and, and I was working with them to fill them up with the lamp oil, and I had this napkin, this big rag, and, you know, there's like dirt and soot and oil, and, and I got some on my hands, so I went to the napkin and started wiping my hands. It's real quick, turned into this black oil. And the more I wiped my hands on the, on the rag, the dirtier the rag got. And then I would move on and dump some more in and wipe my hands again. And all of a sudden I noticed the, the black just started to like move up my arm. And the rag got dirtier. And as I noticed, as I used the rag, the rag was just making me dirtier. Everything I did, all of my effort was making me dirtier. And all of our efforts to be righteous before God will fail. But our God has given us the gift of Jesus to provide new life in Christ because we can't do it on our own. 1 Peter 1.3 says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his great mercy has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. And so you see that it was through Jesus' resurrection from the dead that we're able to be born again and receive eternal life. 
When Jesus came back to life on the third day, he was the first one of many to be resurrected. He was the first to be raised to new life. And through his resurrection to a new life, Jesus made it possible for us to receive new life through him. That's what Paul meant when he wrote to the Ephesian church in chapter 2, verses 5 and 6. Even when we are dead in our transgressions, made us alive together with Christ, by grace you have been saved, and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. You see, church, Jesus' power over death and sin and the enemy Satan gives all born-again believers the power over sin too. Therefore, in Romans 6, 14, Paul writes, For sin shall not be master over you, for you are not under the law but under grace. Jesus secured our regeneration when he resurrected from the dead. And through that gave us all power over sin. And so now you can walk with God as a righteous one. And you can follow that path of righteousness with Christ. He not only secured our regeneration, making us to be born again. He secured our justification, making us not guilty before God. God created a perfect world. And he created us for a purpose. Our purpose is to worship God. That's why he made us. That's why we exist. To cultivate his creation and to experience the joy that comes from fulfilling our purpose. Now, we decided not to fulfill our purpose. And instead, we chose to go our own way. And ever since that moment in the Garden of Eden, when Adam and Eve ate the forbidden fruit of the knowledge of good and evil, every person has been infected and infatuated with sin and guilty before a holy God. That's a pretty serious problem. That's a problem we can't fix on our own. That problem gets very serious when we die. And if we die apart from Christ, we will spend an eternity separated from him in a very real place called hell where we experience unending torment. But God loves us. We have a saving God. He sent his one and only son for you so that you wouldn't have to go to hell. John 3.16 is a passage many of you have probably memorized. Often in our study of that passage, we stop at 3.16, but let me read the whole thing for you. It says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. Listen to verse 17. For God did not send his Son into the world to judge the world, but that the world might be saved through him. God sent Jesus to save you. God sent Jesus because he loves you. We would not, we, we could not justify ourselves before a holy God, but as John declares, he has a plan to justify us. He has a plan to make us right before him, to make us righteous through Jesus Romans 4, 25 declares something important about Jesus. It says, He who was delivered over because of our transgressions and was raised because of our justification. When the Lord Jesus died and was buried in the ground, God the Father raised him back to life, and in doing so, he placed his stamp of approval on what Jesus did through his death on the cross. On that third day when Jesus rose from the dead, God approved of his life and his sacrificial death. And Jesus' redemptive work was finished, and God approved of his work. 
which is applied now to all born-again believers, making us justified or righteous in the eyes of God. So that now when God looks upon you, he, he doesn't see your mistakes. He doesn't see your sin. He doesn't see the things that you've done wrong in the past. When he looks at you, he sees the righteousness of Christ on you. When he raised Jesus from the dead on that third day, God was saying, well done, my son. And when we repent of our sin and receive Jesus as our Lord and Savior, the righteousness of Christ is applied to us so that when God looks upon us, he sees the righteousness of Christ in us. So Jesus, when he rose from the dead, he secured our regeneration. He secured our justification and finally, he secured our resurrection. The tomb in which he was buried was empty. When those faithful women who arrived there first came to the tomb at dawn, Jesus wasn't in the tomb because he had risen from the dead, because he was alive. The body that was in the tomb was now filled with life. Because Jesus rose from the dead. But this was no normal human body. When Jesus came back to life on the third day, he had a glorified body. A body that will last forever. A body that's no longer subject to the effects of pain and hunger and sickness or decay. Man, that's starting to sound pretty good, isn't it? And most importantly... After Jesus resurrected from the dead, his glorified body will never die. The Lord Jesus was the first to receive the glorified body, but he isn't the last. 2 Corinthians 4.14 says, Knowing that he who raised the Lord Jesus will raise us also with Jesus and will present us to you. His resurrection from the dead secured our future resurrected and glorified bodies that we will receive at the end of this age that we will enjoy for eternity in the new heavens and the new earth i'm 44. i think that check engine light came on a couple years ago amen if you didn't say that you're just not old enough yet or you got some good medicine. The other day I went out, I hadn't cut the grass in like three weeks. By the way, in, this, in the sunrise service, that got a, a comment from somebody <laughs> that brought me shame. It was, it had been, I'm, I'm, gonna just con, I'm gonna confess in front of all of you. Three weeks I didn't cut the grass, all right? There was grass growing over the sidewalk. In Iowa, they would say that I was making hay with my lawnmower, that's how long the grass was. It took me three hours to cut that grass. And at the end of cutting that grass, I think everything in my body hurt. I used to go run around all day. No pain whatsoever. I was outside three hours in the sun, and things hurt on my body that I didn't even know I had. So we have pain, right? That's a part of the living in the fallen world. We get sick. I get sick pretty often. You know why? Because when those sweet little babies of yours come up to me, and their noses are running, and their eyes are all clogged up with sleepy bugs, and they've got a fever going, and they walk up to me, and they just put their hands up like this. You know what I'm going to do? 100%, 10 out of 10 times, I'm picking them up. And then sure enough, a few days later, I enjoy whatever it is that they were cultivating on their face. So we get sick. We're tired at the end of the day. We're worn down. God didn't create us to experience that. And because Jesus rose from the dead, we won't always experience that. We experience all those things because we live in a broken world, but at the end of this age, God will perfect our bodies and we will live on in a perfect world, in a glorified, perfect body. 
And we'll be in a place in the presence of God where there's no sadness, there's no sickness. You won't grow old, and you're not going to get cold or hot. You'll never hunger, and you'll never be thirsty. And you will look upon the face of God. And every year I pray that this will be the last year that we have to celebrate the resurrection of Jesus in this place. Because, oh man, I can't wait to see the face of my Lord and to celebrate it in person with him. The Bible says that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, but God in his great love for us has sent his son to die for us on the cross. Jesus on that cross died and shed his blood, but he was buried in the ground. And when it looked as if all hope had been lost, his disciples were scattered. The Pharisees and the Sadducees and the Herodians were celebrating what looked like the end of the life of Christ. And everyone was wondering, where did our Messiah go and what am I going to do tomorrow? On that third day, they came to the grave and his body was gone because he rose from the dead. And now because Jesus rose from the dead, now we've been risen by him to be born again, to be justified in the eyes of God and to receive everlasting life and regenerated bodies. And that's the God we serve. And that's what Jesus did for us on the cross. That's what he accomplished in raising from the dead. And now perhaps today on this Easter... Maybe you came because you always come to church on Sundays. Maybe you came because someone invited you. Maybe you came because you felt like it's Easter, we need to go to church today. We're glad you're here. But at the end of every sermon, after we preach the word of God, we give you an opportunity to respond to what God is doing through his Holy Spirit. So what is the what's next for you? For someone in here, perhaps the what's next for you is to experience the everlasting life that Jesus offers to all who repent and follow him as Lord and Savior. Maybe today you need to be born again. And you can be. Now if you want to be born again, if you're not yet following Christ, in a minute we're all going to sing a song together. I'm going to go right down here. I want you to come down. And I'm going to show you the way to Christ. To receive that gift. That's the single best thing you could do on Easter, to be saved. Maybe you've wandered for a season from Christ. Maybe you're back here today and you feel in your heart that call from God, that familiar conviction from his spirit. And you know what he's telling you. It's it's time to come home. It's time to reconnect with the Father through the Son. It's time for you to be part of the church, to worship and serve and grow. I don't even need to tell you that. You know that's what time it is for you. You come down when we're singing this song. You make things right with the Lord. You renew that commitment to him. Others of you, you love Jesus. You're part of the church. You're worshiping somewhere. Maybe you're just visiting with us today. And today is the day for you to celebrate. Just to celebrate the joy that comes from following Jesus. I want to invite everybody to stand. Heavenly Father, during this time of decision, help us to surrender ourselves to the leadership of your Holy Spirit. And Lord, we pray that you would move in a mighty way in these next few moments, that you would give us the faith we need to make the decision that we need to make. For the one who does not yet know you as Lord, I pray that you would bring him or her forward so we can lead them to you. For the one that needs to come back, that wayward son or daughter, who knows that it's time to come home, Bring them back to yourself, Lord. Give them faith to take that step out of the pew and into the aisle and up front here to make that commitment to you. For others, Lord, fill their heart with joy. The joy that comes from following you. The joy that comes from remembering and celebrating 
that you didn't stay dead, but that you rose from the dead on the third day, that you conquered death and sin and the enemy Satan, that you made it possible for us to be saved. We pray, Lord, over these next few moments that you would move in accordance with your will. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. You come as the Lord leads.
Amen. God is good. And all the time. Happy Easter and God bless you. Uh, There is no evening service this evening. Enjoy the time with your family and we look forward to seeing you back again next Sunday at 11 o'clock. Happy Easter.